insightful podcasts by informative hosts. Insights into Things, a podcast network. Welcome to Insights into Entertainment, a podcast series taking a deeper look into entertainment and media. Your hosts, Joseph and Michelle Whalen, a husband and wife team of pop culture fanatics, are exploring all things from music and movies to television and fandom. Welcome to Insight into Entertainment. This is episode 82. The Emmy goes to Baby Yoda. (laughs) I'm your host, Joseph Whalen. My hardworking and tolerant co-host, Michelle Whalen. How you doing today, <laughs> sweetheart? I'm doing okay, thank you. So just the inside joke here. Uh, <laughs> today's descriptors for Michelle were actually courtesy of our daughter's podcast from last week. Mm-hmm. When she was asked to describe each of us in three words. Those were two of your her words. Although hardworking, we're saying, is one word. <laughs> Anyway, I figured I'd throw that in there. Thanks, I appreciate that. As a little inside plug there. Mm -hmm. So, pretty busy show today. Got Mm -hmm. a lot of articles to go through. In our Disney Detective, we'll talk about Disneyland moving out of the art for another type of item to sell and a little history about beloved horse. Now, just, you know, total disclosure here, I don't write the summaries. Nor did I get a chance to read through all the articles, so I'll be as surprised as the audience (laughs) when we get to that. Awesome. Um, In our Tales from the Edge of the Galaxy, Baby Yoda's first award. Aww. Trouble for the Mando. Uh, And get that credit card ready because there's more Star Wars merchandise becoming available. Those articles I did read, by the way. I figured. For our entertainment news, we'll take a look at who's probably going to be the next Marvel villain and a different kind of parade for the holidays. Then we'll finish up with our insightful picks of the week and a little tribute we have at the end of the show as well. So stick around for that. Uh, Before we get started, though, I would uh, suggest, implore, beg, please, uh, please, please. (laughs) For people to subscribe to us, uh, you can – go ahead. I totally lost the thought, so. Uh, you can subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, TuneIn, and Amazon. Uh, we also welcome any feedback that you have. You can email us at comments at insightsintothings.com. You can hit us on Twitter at insights underscore things. You can catch our high-res videos on YouTube at youtube.com slash insights into things. We do stream six days a week on Twitch at twitch.tv slash insights into things. And if you are a Prime, uh, Amazon Prime member, you do get a monthly Twitch Prime subscription for free. Include it with your Amazon Prime. And we would uh, appreciate it if you throw a little love our way and subscribe to us with that. You can catch our audio versions at podcast.insightsintoentertainment.com. We are also available on Facebook at facebook.com slash insights into things podcast. And finally, all of those links, with the exception of our Instagram link, because we still haven't put that in the show notes or on the website. We're going to have to fix that on the website at least. But you can get all of these links on the web on our website at www.insightsintothings.com. Are we ready to get started? Sure. All right, let's do it. Oh. 
go for Disney Detective. So Disneyland obviously has uh, been closed for more than six months now, and only the downtown Disney shopping area is currently open to guests. So now Disney has decided to use a new spot to sell merchandise that was previously exclusive to Star Wars Galaxy's Edge. So it's great news for those that can't get into the park, but unfortunately, it's kind of bad news if you're a fan of Disney art, because the location that they're using is downtown Disney's Wonderground Gallery. Now, Wonderground Gallery has previously been the home of Disney-themed art made by independent artists. Uh, the art is there to enjoy if you want to look at it, and obviously... Uh, it's it's there to to purchase as well, and a lot of one of a kind items uh, were usually there as well. Um, so unfortunately, it's kind of sad news for Disney artists because this, in a lot of cases, was one of the only places where their art was being sold. Now there are some artists that are going to be selling their art online. But you have to know who the artist is to to find it, because a lot of people don't know who some of these Disney artists are unless they actually see their artwork. So now it's kind of being, you know, hindered. Um, hopefully, though, that this is just a temporary decision, that it's not a, a permanent thing, so that once the parks do open up, the merchandise can be moved back into the actual park. Um, now, somebody um, that noticed the the area, you know, they were starting to take out the the Disney art, and they were kind of making it um, because if you've been to Galaxy's Edge or if you've read about it, they try and immerse you in the area. Um, you know, when when you go there, they don't reference other areas of the park. You know, it's like you're on. That too. So what somebody uh, had mentioned in the article was that they were kind of making it so like this was an artist from Batu, and you know the goods that you were getting could only be found from Batu. So you know it's nice that they're bringing that to to guests that can't get into the park to to purchase anything. But on the downside, kind of you know sad for those artists that that was really the only way their art was was being seen you know, by other people. So have they confirmed that this is just a temporary thing? They haven't confirmed it, but it, it kind of leads to, you know, the, the idea that it, that it is just temporary because they didn't, um, there's one of the artists I saw, they posted something on Facebook where, you know, they were like, we don't know how long this is for, but it's just for now. So, you know, they haven't been told like, Hey, get all your art because we're not selling it anymore. Um, so hopefully it's it's just a, a temporary thing. Now, when they did have the art there, was Disney, was were the artists getting direct funds from the sales, or was mm -hmm. it a commission type thing? No, I Disney? think they were getting the, the direct sales. So this is really just a money grab for Disney? Of course. Okay, I just wanted to clarify that. <laughs> Isn't it always? <laughs> yeah. So what else do we have? Um, so this was a, a cute little, you know, story that I, I found, you know, looking at, at different news articles. You know, the, there were a couple of different things that popped up about Disney during the week. And, you know, not to to bring light to him, but there was, you know, a, a guy who took his mask off and started this whole thing. Well, anyway, he got banned. So I didn't want to talk about that one. I wanted something a little bit more lighthearted. Um, so this was actually a story that came up about jingles. Um, so, and this was, this was kind of, you know, a, a, a cute little, you know, history story. Um, you know, so for those that, you know, go to the Disney parks, you know, going into to fantasy land, one of the, the big attractions is is the carousel. And in Disneyland, it's King Arthur's carousel. And it's, you know, uh, very historic in, in a lot of ways, because for those that don't know, 
Walt Disney actually came up with the idea of building Disneyland while he was sitting on a park bench with his daughters and they were riding the merry-go-round um, in Griffith Park in Los Angeles. And that's when he got the idea that, you know, the f- there should be a park where the family can can enjoy things together. So obviously the carousel meant a lot to him. Um, so when they had built Disneyland. Um, they had actually uh, commissioned a company in Canada to make the carousel horses and ship them to California in 1954. Um, now, one horse was painted white and all the other ones were were browns and, and tans and things like that. And by 1975, they actually overhauled all of the horses and made them all white, all with different themings. Um, and actually, what's interesting is all of the horses have a name, and you can actually go to City Hall on Main Street and get a copy of the names of all the horses. Well, one horse in particular is is kind of the the favorite of of the bunch, and that is Jingles. Um, he's considered the lead horse, and after going through many refreshes over the years, he actually now has a makeover um, based off of Mary Mary Poppins, um, and he uh, has her initials uh, listed. He's the most ornate of the horses. Um, he even has a little hidden Mickey and also... Um, uh, Mary Poppins umbrella is actually uh, located in, yeah, in uh, uh, painted on him. So just a cute little story uh, to kind of, you know, throw out there. Um, so, you know, he, again, he's the most decorated horse. He's considered the lead horse. And there have been lots of different, you know, photos taken with different celebrities that, you know, when they go, they try and find this horse uh, to to get a, you know, to get a ride on. So, yeah. And this is just Disneyland. Just do Disneyland. They, do they no. do the unique naming for Disney World they Carousel? They probably do because, you know. Because no, I know the Disney World Carousel actually originated in New Jersey. Right. And that so we did. So there's a New Jersey connection there. Right. I'm sure they probably have horses. Probably not the same names. But I don't know. We've never we've never asked. So that can be that on be our. would be really something that would be cool on like a podcast with like secret Disney stuff. We'll have to write that one down. We'll have to think about that yeah. one. <laughs> yeah. Nice. So nice story though. That was mm-hmm. that was very cute. Thank uh, you. And I think that was all we had for Disney Detective mm-hmm. this week. We'll take a quick break and we'll be back with our tales from the edge of the galaxy. <laughs> For over seven years, the Second Sith Empire has been the premier community guild in the online game Star Wars The Old Republic. With hundreds of friendly and helpful active members, a weekly schedule of nightly events, annual guild meet and greets, and an active community both on the web and on Discord. The Second Sith Empire is more than your typical gaming group. We're family. Join us on the Star Forge server for nightly events such as operations, flashpoints, world boss hunts, Star Wars trivia, guild lottery, and much more. Visit us on the web today at www.thesecondsithempire.com. Go for Tales from the Edge of the Galaxy. (laughs) Uh, So the first ever uh, 2020 Emmy Awards is set for this weekend, and for the first time, it will be done virtually. But as a tradition, a few statues have obviously already been handed out because usually the week before, they do the Creative Arts Emmys. And that's the one that honors the costumers, production designers, visual effects artists, makeup and, and hairstylists. Also, this way, the show isn't more than like five five hours. 
<laughs> that's that's part of it too. Um, but what was really cool was it. So it took place on Wednesday, and one of the big winners was the Mandalorian, thanks to no small part than our lovable little baby, baby Yoda. Um, so he was actually competing against, uh, Lost in Space and Stranger Things, uh, The Watchmen and Westworld, and this is actually the first major Disney Plus series that took home an award for outstanding special, special video effects, specifically for work accomplished on, uh, episode two, which was The Child. Uh, so the award went to a number of the show's visual effects artists. Um, so the supervisors and all the, the technicians and the producers, they, you know, all, um, were able to, to get an award for this. Uh, so among the visual effects war award, the Mandalorian also received accolades for, Outstanding production design for a narrative program, outstanding sound editing for a comedy or drama series, um, outstanding sound mixing for a comedy or drama series, and outstanding cinematography for a single camera series. Phew! <laughs> That's a lot. Um, so, Obviously, The Mandalorian might not be done yet because the series is actually set to compete for outstanding drama when the Emmy Awards airs on Sunday. Um, and obviously, the new season is going to be premiering on October 30th. Very cool. Very cool. And, and, you know, the show itself was incredibly well produced. Mm hmm. And, you know, we had the, um, the good fortune to watch the documentary on it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And just seeing some of the techniques that they had for the production, for the realism, for the sets, for, right. you know, it was just, it was awesome, mm -hmm. you know? And, uh, you know, I can't help but harken back to the, the one episode that was very late in the season where you see Dave Filoni and a couple of the right. directors show up in costume in the series right. in X-Wing fighters. Right, right. Um, and then to think that that X-Wing fighter is the one that's actually in Galaxy's Edge yeah. in Florida. Yeah. That's the level of realism, right. you know, that they bring to, to mm -hmm. everything that they do. So kudos to them for mm -hmm. that. What else do we have? So, more Mandalorian news, and it seems that, hmm, the Mandalorian star reportedly quit the show halfway through the season. What? So, we had actually talked about this a couple of weeks ago. There was, you know, some news that something was going on and, and you know, why the trailer hadn't dropped yet. And insider Grace Randolph, you know you know, really didn't say a whole lot, but had said something was amiss. She couldn't really talk about it. But, you know, as soon as she got more details, something would come out. And now it seems um, more has come out. So we did get the new trailer. So if you haven't seen it, it looks awesome. Uh, there were new photos that, that came out um, and also a, a new logo um, for the series as well. Um, so what she had actually claimed was that the leading man, Pedro Pascal, had actually left production halfway through the shooting. She had said, uh, while filming season two, Pedro Pascal really wanted to have some scenes with his helmet off. The Mandalorian creative team wouldn't budge on this. So Pedro Pascal, from what uh, I've heard from two sources now was frustrated about this and also was pretty darn uncomfortable in the Mando suit on set. So he became difficult. And the final straw, even though he was difficult to be around on set, the final straw that was he went to Lucasfilm and from what I've heard from my sources try to get them to intervene on his behalf. And you combine that with Lucasfilm already trying to get involved with story aspects of season two, from which I've heard, including focusing more on a standalone episode rather than making them all connected. The Mandalorian creative team wanted to do so, which was kind of happening at the end of season one. So when Pedro went to Lucasfilm, the Mando team was like, you know what? You should just go. And Pedro did. 
And that's what happened halfway through filming. She said, you know, and she uh, also says that she heard that the breakup was pretty bad with both sides being upset. So, again, nothing has come out whether or not this is true. This was actually in a couple of different articles um, that that popped up about it. So if it does turn out to be true, though, John, Fal- uh, sorry, John Favreau is obviously keeping it under wraps. And that could also explain why season two is set to a wider uh, to a, a wider scope to focus on other characters and other subplots. And, you know, in, in this article, they said, no offense to him, but it would, wouldn't be too hard to replace him because from what we saw in uh, the documentary, he wasn't always on set. He had a, a body double who was doing a lot of the, the physical acting because he was in New York, I think, uh, working on Broadway, and he was recording his lines elsewhere so technically if he does up and leave or did up and leave he could be replaced very easily with somebody just doing the voiceover work and you know somebody else in the suit but again nothing's come out if that really happened or not but you know and that's the thing i find it very hard to believe that something that significant (laughs) could happen and it hasn't made it to mainstream media at this yeah. point in time. Yeah. I could see where some of that may have happened where he expressed his mm-hmm. discontent at right. having to have the helmet on the whole time. Right. I could totally see there being a scenario where he did ask for more face time. Mm-hmm. Uh, especially given the fact that, you know, we talked about the award shows and stuff like mm-hmm. that and the fact that he didn't qualify for them because, right, because of that. Because you couldn't see that it was him. So I could see him making an issue of it. Mm-hmm. But I don't like he's under contract too. Right. So I find it hard to believe that Disney let him walk out of his contract. Considering yeah. how significant this series is and how much money it's making oh, for absolutely. them. Oh, absolutely. You don't just let your star walk out when he's under contract. Right. So I take this report with a with a grain of salt, you know. I could certainly see how it will influence the rest of the season where you right. may be trying to downplay him because you might I don't know how long his contract was. You might right, not right. have him under contract. But they they green light of the third season. Mm-hmm. So I have to assume you, all your actors are under contract right. for at least that long. And, and the show was called The Mandalorian. So is it something where, is he not the main Mandalorian? Does something happen? You know, do they well, end and, up? And you from know? a lore standpoint, <clears throat> there isn't a Mandalorian. Right. You know, Mandalorians it's, are a culture. Right. And that's the thing is, d- does the storyline, you know. Right. Do you hand it off to another to, Mandalorian right, exactly. to continue on? Right. Exactly. So I, I don't know. I don't know. We'll, we'll, we'll see. We'll see. We'll see how it goes. Yeah. So tell me how I can waste more of my hard earned (laughs) money on Star Wars merchandise because I'm I'm jonesing for some for for some new toys. I I know you are. So a special delivery is is on its way from the planet of Batu, landing online at shopdisney.com later this month. So the for the first time ever Items direct from Star Wars Galaxy's Edge inside Hollywood Studios at Walt Disney World and at Disneyland Resort will be available outside the themed lands. So beginning September 28th on ShopDisney.com, Jedi and Sith fans can outfit themselves with Galactic Adventure with garments and gear direct from Black Spire uh, Outfitters. Then complete the look with mysterious artifacts including legacy lightsabers Ooh. and now through october 1st fans can actually vote for the next legacy lightsaber that they would hope to see offered at i'm gonna screw up his name so you can say it no no you say it. this is good this is like part of the show now doc arndors yeah, that's pretty oh, good. Oh, wow. Den of Antiquities. Woohoo. Um, modeled after the lightsabers of some of the most heroic, iconic, and sometimes sinister cal- uh, characters in the Star Wars galaxy. So you get to cast your ballot for one of the six choices. They could be Anakin Skywalker, uh, Qui Gon Jinn, uh, Ezra, or Lord Corvax. 
from the new comics. From the new comics. Um, his actually looked pretty badass, yeah, actually. Pretty cool. um, so current lightsabers and gear from Black Spire Outfitters will be available on ShopDisney.com for a lit- limited time and also with limited quantities. Additional shipments and other items are actually uh, headed to Star Wars Trading Post in uh, Disney Springs at Walt Disney World. And obviously, w- as we just mentioned, uh, downtown Disney district at disneyland will be getting uh some of the items as well well this would be cool i mean you know when when we were down there we uh well you spent lots of money (laughs) i kind of went a little crazy (laughs) down there with the stuff that i was buying and and rightfully so because it was the first time they had a lot of these you know cool artifact type you know, items. And the thing was, you weren't the only one, right. you know, everybody was, you know, because it was, it was not your traditional souvenir. Right. You know, it was something completely different. If you're, you know, a a, a, a huge fan of the series of the books, um, you know, of, of the comics, you know, there's all these little things, you know, because honestly, I'm a fan of the movies and that's about it. And, and I admit it. So looking at some of the stuff, I'm like, okay, that's kind of, that's kind of cool. And you're like, Oh my God, that's so awesome. Well, well you what's, know? what's neat is it's stuff that you can't buy elsewhere right. for the most part. Absolutely. It's all unique things mm-hmm. that they made just for this attraction. Mm-hmm. It's not Hasbro toys or right. something like that. Right. They're not one-offs, right. but they're rare enough that, if you can't afford to go to Disney to buy these, you're never going to get these things. Right. Unless you buy them off eBay with incredible markups. Right. And now here's a chance to. But I think, you, you know, know, Disney being the money grubbing or, you know, evil empire that they are. <laughs> They're not doing this out of the kindness of their heart. I, I think they kind of realized <laughs> how much they were limiting mm-hmm. their market and their profit on this. Right. Now, d- just to, to add, this is different from the Star Wars Galaxy's Edge items that are available through Target. Because Target had their own line of, right. of stuff that we talked about a couple of weeks ago as well. So this is, again, completely different. This would be the merchandise that you could only get if you actually went to galaxy's edge in the parks right and you know what i this is the the closest parallel i think i can come up with here is the haunted mansion stuff Mm -hmm. where if you wanted to buy uh, well up until just fairly recently right you couldn't buy the haunted mansion stuff unless it was stuff that was on the cart outside the attraction right you know until they open up momentum mori's right you couldn't get a lot of that stuff. Right. And that's the thing is for Haunted Mansion fans, you know, there was so little out there for so many years. It was, you know, every now and then one little thing would kind of pop up. But what's kind of funny to kind of add to that is back in the day, the only people that had a Mickey Mouse t-shirt were people that went to Disneyland or Disney World. So, you know, we're talking like, you know, back when, you know, like, the 50s the 60s the 70s even you know so if you saw somebody wearing a mickey mouse t-shirt that meant that they got it from disney or somebody they knew got it from disney so you know it now you can go to target and walmart and heck you can go to you know the grocery store and find you know something with, with a mouse on it so there isn't that specialty you know item you know so well, much I, I think that's what i think that's what confuses me about disney is that disney their primary focus is making money mm-hmm. they've made no bones about that uh the rates that they charge the right. services they offer it's all about making money so why would you restrict the the market in which you're going to sell these things that are they're not small ticket items you right know? i and- mean you're looking at items that are from that list alone. Right. At least $150 per shot. Right. Minimum. So why would you limit the market that you're going to offer that at when you have a huge group of people out there who want to buy this? Yeah, I don't know. And maybe that's kind of, you know, like 
how even with with haunted mansion stuff now you know for the anniversary the 50th anniversary last year they release you know things that you could get at hot topic and target and you know everybody kind of had their own like exclusive thing and they kind of did spread the wealth a little yet there were still things that were only exclusive to the parks and maybe that's kind of you know like okay we're giving target some items here well, and i can see park you know. exclusives for mm-hmm. events right okay like when you used to do star wars weekends that right was an there event. Was... you had to go there to get it i totally right. get that right but you have an entire product line here that mm-hmm. in order for someone to come and buy that product line they have to travel to florida right or california they have to pay buy a ticket to get in a hundred dollars or more to get into the park mm-hmm just to go shopping? Right. I mean, that's that's a little insane there. So, when you could be selling this stuff on your website. It's not even like you don't have a, a e-commerce presence, right? Right, right. So, it's already there. Yeah, it it makes no sense that you would you would shut that down. Yeah. But anyway, that was all we had for our tales from the edge of the galaxy. Uh we'll be right back with our entertainment news of the week. <laughs> Insights into Teens, a podcast series exploring the issues and challenges of today's youth. Talking to real teens about real teen problems. Explore issues from braces to puberty, social anxiety to financial responsibility. Each week, we talk about the topics concerning today's youth. We look at how the issues affect teens, how to cope with these issues, and how parents, friends, and loved ones can help teens handle these challenges. Check out our video episodes on youtube.com backslash insights into things. Catch our audio versions on podcast.insightsintoteens.com on the web at insightsintothings.com. And now for Entertainment News of the Week. So it seems that Marvel is about to introduce what could be the most pivotal and fearsome character yet. So obviously the Infinity Saga... Uh, had officially, you know, ended with uh, Avengers Endgame in 2019, and now we're all waiting for the next, uh, you know, set of movies to come out for for these Marvel films. So in recent reports have claimed that the forthcoming third Ant-Man film will introduce a character named Kang the Conqueror, who will be played by uh, Jonathan Majors. So those that are unfamiliar, like myself, with the comics may be interested to know that he is one of the most powerful and important villains to have ever been created by Marvel. Essentially, he is a time-hopping antagonist who will no doubt appear as a conquest for the Avengers creation of an alternate timeline in Endgame. Um, his character's power comes from the fact that he can manipulate the course of history by freely moving through time. Um, so one of the other things, uh, you know, again, for people that aren't in the know, like me, um, that he is actually a primary character from the Fantastic Four comics, meaning that obviously they're hoping to set up you know, the next recreation of, of the Fantastic Four. Um, and that also he has ties um, that could introduce the X-Men into the fold uh, sooner than expected, um, as well as a young version of the Avengers, which includes Ant-Man's daughter, Cassie. Um, so this is kind of good news for Marvel fans that have been waiting to to hear who the next, you know, villain could be and where the next, you know, storyline is going. Since we haven't really heard much about the movies, we have heard about, you know, the various shows that are going to be coming to, to Disney Plus, but nothing about the next uh, version of the, the MCU. So 
this is kind of kind of cool to to hear about. So yeah, and I and I suppose that everything that we're seeing now and speculating on now is going to be nothing like how we're going to actually see it play out <laughs> in the movies because we went through all the speculation with the Infinity Stones and the Tesseract and you know Thanos and all that stuff, and none of that played out the way that we thought it was going to play out. Uh, so it's kind of fun playing these little guessing games here. <laughs> what are they going to do next? <laughs> but, you know, we've, we've been waiting for them mm -hmm. to pick up Fantastic Four. We knew they've mm -hmm. had that in the wings there. Right. Because the last two iterations of it have not been, not been so spectacular. Yeah. So I think in the hands of Marvel Studios, they'll do better. The question mark is still X-Men because the licensing on X-Men is still kind of up in the air. Mm -hmm, right. They don't have the rights to it, just like they don't have the rights to uh, Spider-Man at this right. point in time. So anything they do with X-Men, they're going to have to work out the details there. Right, right. Uh, but yeah, I think it's exciting. I think mm -hmm. it's definitely going to take us down a different path. He's the most powerful and most intimidating villain since the last most powerful and intimidating villain. So... <laughs> Welcome to comic books, folks. <laughs> nice. <laughs> so, uh, Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade is not going to be quite the same as it usually is. No, it is not. So the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade, um, for fans that, you know, that watch it on, you know, Thanksgiving morning, unfortunately has been formally canceled for 2020 due to the ongoing coronavirus pandemic. Uh, New York City Mayor Bill de Blasio had made the announcement on Monday, stating that instead of a live event, the team behind the parade is working on something unique. He said it will not be the same parade we're used to. It'll be a different kind of event. Uh, he also added they're reinventing the event for the moment in his for this moment in history and you'll i lost my place where was i um do, 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 and it'll be not not be the same parade that we're used to it'll be a different kind of event they're reinventing the bleh, they're reinventing the event for this moment in history and you'll be able to feel the spirit and the joy of that day on television online not in a live parade but something that will really give us that warmth and that great feeling that we uh, all have on Thanksgiving Day. Um, for more than 90 years, the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade has kicked off the holiday season with its signature entertainment spectacle, making it one of the most beloved events. He said, following our successful safe uh, production of the Macy's 4th of July fireworks, it is our intention to similarly imagine Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade this November. Stay tuned for more details this fall. Um, you know, it, it's not surprising that, <clears throat> you know, the news came out, um, because you see Disney and, and all the other theme parks that do fireworks and do parades have canceled them or they've modified the way that they are, um, you know, for the, the Macy's parade, um, you know, for those that, that live up in that area, a lot of families go um wednesday night to watch the balloons being blown up um there are families that you know will wait for hours you know on the city streets to to watch the parade or those that work nearby or have apartments nearby they'll do parade watching you know from from the buildings and stuff um so it'll be interesting to see how they kind of pull this off virtually you know obviously pre-recorded you know they they always had the um any of the musical entertainment was usually pre-recorded music you know the the singers would just lip sync it um but they always would do little um bits from musical numbers of various uh broadway shows you could technically do oh, that and but None of the Broadway shows are, are open right now. You so. know, they could get away with this as simply as using stock footage and showing mm -hmm. you some historical parades sure, from the past and sure. stuff like it, that. Sure, it could totally be a historic 
you know, look at the the ninety years. Let's right. let's go back. Let's you do know. a review of what how this parade has evolved. Let's look right. at the different action. You could even do pre recorded mm-hmm. uh, segments and stuff like that that are off the parade route and and things like that. So right. There's ways to do it. I think what you're going to miss out. I think the television experience probably will be fine for the television mm-hmm. viewers. Right. What you're going to miss is that in-person appearance, that right. family tradition mm-hmm. of going. Like we have friends that go right the night before to watch this stuff, right, and then right. they, and they they stay in the city and they watch the parade. Mm-hmm. It's that experience mm-hmm. that you're going to lose, right? So that's the unfortunate part. But you know, it is what it is. This right. is what you have to do these days, right. right? But at least it's not like. You know, the Broadway shows where you can't go and see, uh, you know, a Broadway show, even though PBS and other places have been, uh, you know, streaming yeah. them, you know, it, it, it kind of makes sense. Um, you know, and one of the other things that obviously came out as well is that the uh, Radio City Music Hall, the Christmas Spectacular, also has been canceled. And that's a, a big event. Um that well, and I think that's kind of the theme of 2020. Oh yeah, this year's just been canceled. Yeah, you know, Come look back for, next year. And look we'll for see us what we next year. Yeah. yeah, you know, take take the time to to reflect and and spend time with with your loved ones. Yeah. Stay it's, home, enjoy the family, save a few bucks, and next year maybe we'll come back and we right. can start the world again. Yeah, yeah. So thank you, COVID. <laughs> so that was all we had for our entertainment news. Yep, we'll be back it. in a moment. For our insightful picks of the week. Go for your insightful pick. So this was actually going to be a Disney detective story. I had started uh, writing it up that way. And then as I realized, it was really more of an insightful pick. Um, So during the time of lockdown, Disney has been trying to share some joy with various videos on their YouTube channel. Um, And as we've talked about before, they've released various recipes for uh, park food favorites. We had the Dole Whip recipe. They had beignets. Um, You know, the gray stuff even, uh, you know, was something that came out. And now they've actually added some videos um, to give you some secrets about some of the most beloved rides. Um, So this week, they actually posted a little video about Pirates of the Caribbean in Disneyland. Now, kind of appropriate because today is Talk Like a Pirate Day, but I'm not going to I'm not going to do that. Um, What's interesting is that these videos are, you know, little two minute videos that kind of give you a a little quick history about the ride. Um, So for the Disneyland uh, Pirates of the Caribbean, you know, they kind of do a a ride through. I think they have it listed as a ride and learn um, when you're watching the video. And it talks about how like Exitensio voiced the skeleton that is seen before the first drop and that he's also responsible for the lyrics of the song, Yo Ho, A Pirate's Life for Me. Um, And that this ride was actually the last that Walt helped to develop before he had passed away. Um, And another little tidbit about it is that the local fire department when they were visiting to sign off on the permits, they were so convinced by the fire effects that they required that during an emergency, the fire effects are turned off not to confuse people to think that they, that the ride was really on fire. So that was, that was kind of a, a interesting little thing. Um, <clears throat> And then there was another video that they posted about Radiator Springs Racers, which was one of the rides that Maddie and I got to experience when we were out in California uh, a few years ago. Um, and it talks about how that, with the exception of two of the characters, all of the original actors from the movies voiced their various characters uh, that are seen on on the ride. And that those animatronic audio animatronics are actually the most advanced that they created for uh, this ride. Um, and that on average, each car performs 1.5 million times a year. <laughs> um, and that each ride vehicle actually travels 36,000 miles a year. So it's it's a pretty long ride, and um, so that was kind of cool. Um, and then, obviously, one of my most favorite videos, I bet you can't guess what ride it's about. It's a small world. 
how'd you know? <laughs> is about the haunted mansion. And this is kind of neat because it's, again, two minute little, you know, uh, documentary on it. Um, and it's actually uh, Disney legend uh, Raleigh Crump talks about his shared experience about creating um, the haunted mansion. And um, what's funny is like all of his ideas that he put into it, none of them got added in, you know, that basically it's, you know, he worked with it with Yale Gracie and, you know, 90% of what Yale did is your current haunted mansion. So if you took out, you know, all the different effects that, that Yale put into it, you wouldn't even have a ride. But one of the neat things is that somebody had asked him if the wallpaper was his idea. And he was like, I don't think it was. And what it was, was another artist took one of his ideas of chandeliers that he had that, again, none of his original ideas went into the Haunted Mansion and kind of modified it. And that became the wallpaper. So his you know, original designs kind of inspired something that is is in and beloved by Haunted Mansion fans. So really kind of cool, different, unique things. So if you go to, to Disney Parks on YouTube, they have all these various different videos. Again, uh, Park and Learn, different food recipes, and you can kind of just go down that rabbit hole and, and spend a couple of hours getting your, your Disney on if you're not going to the parks. Cool. Well, good pick. Thank you. So my pick this week, much to everyone's surprise, I'm sure. It's a documentary? Is not a documentary. <laughs> it is actually a video game. Not even a video game. It's actually an add-on to a video game. And this is one that our daughter had turned me on to. She plays Sims 4. Yes, she does. She got me into Sims 4. Now, the base game of Sims 4 does have some Star Wars elements in there with some costuming and some props and stuff like that that you can get for the houses. Uh, but what just recently dropped was Star Wars Journey to Batu Game Pack for Sims 4. You can create your Star Wars story. The Resistance, First Order, and Scoundrels are fighting to control Batu but your Sims' actions determine who will succeed. As Sims undertake challenges and special missions, you'll tip the balance of power. Your influence not only changes the world, but also unlocks rewards like Starfighter access, new outfits, and critical missions on Batu. And the one thing that's really neat is, if you've been to Galaxy's Edge at any of the Disney parks, this is faithfully recreated in this expansion. Um, it's not an area in Sims that you can build a house and live there. It's actually a vacation destination. But it is almost 100% accurate when it comes to the scale, the layout, the features. All the major locations in Galaxy's Edge show up in here. So you can go to Doc Ondar's. You can go to the Cantina. You can go see the Millennium Falcon. That's a destination that you have here. Uh, you can go to Black Spire. The Black Spire is, you know, a, a physical feature in this pack. So it's, you know... Very faithful to the actual attraction itself, but there's story elements that are involved. There are, and they, and they play on the story elements that are in Galaxy's Edge as well. So there is a First Order storyline and a Resistance storyline. And those elements play out in the game itself, depending on where you build up your reputation. You'll unlock certain functions and features. You can find all the parts to build a lightsaber, and you can challenge people to lightsaber matches. It's very well done uh, for uh, an add-on, and it's one that I've spent hours just getting lost in and playing around in and you know, having unusual intimate conversations with Kylo Ren at times. Because why not? Uh, yeah, well... You know, it's one of the only Star Wars games out there that 
that takes into account the newer things, mm-hmm. the newer elements of of Star Wars. So kind of fun. It's only uh, I want to say like twenty bucks. I don't know what the price is, but it's not that expensive if you already have Sims Four. Um, but what's really neat is you have all the build elements from expansion pack that you can build a Millennium Falcon for a home, or you can build you know, a Tatooine style home and you can outfit it with Cantina, you know, uh, memorabilia and and baby Yoda's and you can have different species of (laughs) characters now. So it's kind of a cool addition to, to the game itself. And it's a a fresh take on, on star Wars. Very cool pick. So star Wars journey to Batuu, uh, from EA games for Sims four. So uh, that was really all we had for the show. I did have, you know, we we did have some sad news that hit us yesterday that I wanted to kind of address, and I didn't have the the link up. Let me throw my link up here real quick. Um, and I wrote up a little tribute, so I'll try and read it and try not to get emotional while while I'm reading it. Uh, This is a tribute to a real-life heroine. We talk about comic book heroes and superheroes a lot on this podcast. And while the various works of fiction that feature these characters is a source of relief, inspiration, and hope for us, this week we lost a real hero that embodied all those qualities and more. Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, champion of gender equality, has died at the age of 87 after a long and surprisingly successful struggle with cancer. Architect of the legal fight for women's rights in the 1970s, the notorious RBG, as she was affectionately called in recent years, subsequently served 27 years on the nation's highest court, becoming its most prominent member. The notorious RBG has been many things to many people in her 87 years. But most importantly, she was an inspiration to women and girls everywhere that no matter how difficult it might be to stand up for yourself and the rights of others, one person can make a difference. She proved that to the world on more than one occasion. We've lost a leader, an inspiration, a hero, and an amazing woman. Hopefully, the legacy that she left behind will live on through our daughter and others from her generation. So that was all we had for this week. Um, I hate, I really hate ending the show on, on sad news like that, but I, I, I felt, even though it wasn't really entertainment news, she deserved to have a, a tribute on the show here. She's, mm-hmm. well, she means a lot to all of us. Absolutely. She's, it's obviously had an impact on us. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we talk about fake heroes all the time. She is a real hero. She definitely is. We'll just finish up with our, our business here. Um, I do want to invite folks to check out our long form articles on medium at medium.com slash insights into things. You can listen to our audio podcast and subscribe to them. You'll get them as they go live Monday mornings at 8 on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, TuneIn, and Amazon. Uh, And please do reach out to us and give us your feedback. You can reach us via email at comments at insightsintothings.com. On Twitter at insights underscore things. We stream six days a week on Twitch at twitch.tv slash insights into things. On Facebook.com at Facebook. Facebook at Facebook, Facebook.com uh, backslash insights into things podcast. You can catch us on Instagram. There it is at Instagram.com slash insights into things. Uh, all the audio versions of our podcasts are at podcast.insights into entertainment.com. And you can catch high res videos of our shows on YouTube.com slash insights into things. And everything is listed on our website at insightsintothings.com. Except for Instagram, but now that I have the link, I can actually (laughs) fix that. 
Anyway, that's it for this week. Another one in the book. Happy New Year, everyone. Bye. Bye.